I think what was most frustrating was coming up with these great ideas and, and really not having a good finger on the pulse of what all the ramifications are in terms of cost. So the labor market, the materials market right now is, is insane. So anybody who's building or designing anything now knows that um, it's very unpredictable. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we have Matthew Alberg, if I'm saying that That's right. right. Yep. Is that the same as Alberg Ski and Sport? Uh, it's close. You're one letter off. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no family discount okay. for me. Oh. So close up. So today we are speaking with Matthew Alberg, who is the Director of Design Services and Lead Architect at Barrett Maid. I'm saying that right? Yeah, that's right. Alberg graduated magna cum laude with a, with a degree in architecture from Syracuse University. Shout out Syracuse. My parents lived there for oh, yeah. about 10 or 15 years. So I spent a lot of Thanksgivings and Christmases okay. there. So. Um, prior to joining the team at Barrett Made, he worked as a project manager at Scott Simons Architects. He has served as a project designer architect for several AIA and Maine Preservation Award winning projects in New York and greater New England. Our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design. Don't miss Matthew's AIA design theory in the upcoming December issue of Maine Home Design. Thank you for coming into the studio today. Yeah, thanks Matthew. for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, sorry for the earliness and everything, but that's just kind of the life of, I guess, people who have kids and have jobs. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we can't get out of the house early enough anymore, so school right? School starts a little later than we'd like it to. So Yeah, you go from that summer kind of like people wake up a little more haphazardly to yeah. like, oh, you got to be at school by 7 or 8 or whatever yeah. it is. My wife homeschools our kids, so it's less of a, um immediate get on the bus. So. Yeah. But yeah, you missed that. Summer camp, we like the rigidity. I think the kids like the uh, like the idea that they get up and go to the same place every day. But yeah. Yeah, for us, it's a little <laughs> it's a little later than we'd like. We're used to the so they, uh, leftovers from the daycare days where we could get up and just get them out the door at 7 o'clock, but right. not anymore. So um, you sit on North Yarmouth Economic and Sustainability Committee. What does sustainability really mean to you, and how do you hurdle, yeah. not hurdle, heard that and make sure it actually happens. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm not on the committee anymore, but I did serve for a number of years. Um, and I think for them, it was more sustainability from the aspect of what's economically sustainable because it's a, it's a town in a transitional area, I think outside of Portland. So we've seen a lot of growth. So a lot of young families have moved uh, to the suburbs from other places in and around Portland. So a lot of our kids, uh, parents, uh, you know, they first had kids when they were living in Portland and have since moved up. So I think what they're looking for, you know, more than, you know, sustainable in the sense that we think about, uh, you know, design that's sustainable, uh, say building systems, that type of thing. Um, they think about it more in terms of how do they develop a town that offers people some things that want them to stay more long term. So instead of, say, you know, raising your kids there, or sending them through the school systems, and then leaving, they're interested in developing uh, the old sense of village center. So it's a really old town. Uh, North Yarmouth was, they call it the town where others began. So it used to incorporate areas of Yarmouth, Cumberland, uh, Harpswell, uh, Freeport, uh, Durham. So other areas of, of sort of a larger town, they call it ancient North Yarmouth. So what they're sort of trying to do is develop a, a sustainable sense of community. So people, you know, have more invested in the community, a place to, say, start a business, run your business, um, things of right. that nature. So so as a designer, how, how does the rubber meet the road there? Do you say, all right, well, if we're doing this, we have to really protect a, you know, a downtown area that has a central feel to it where community happens and we come off of that or yeah i think that's exactly it so <clears throat> north yarmouth has a village center uh what they call their village center district which is actually where we live um and it's the area that's comprised of a lot of the older farmhouses in town so we have next door neighbors we don't have you know fields between us so what they're trying to do is develop that sort of main street feel so mm -hmm. you know think about place where your kids could go trick-or-treating for example um, right. you know traffic calming is a big thing in town now so they're trying to figure out ways to sort of slow traffic through town create more walkable pedestrian friendly community so in that sense I think yeah sustainability is sort of creating a vibrant downtown that's economically now, viable interestingly uh, people have this idea of creating traffic calming but when it comes to safety 
what I've been told in school when I went to school is that narrower roads with more cars parked on them uh, naturally makes a safer environment coming from the driver perspective yeah. rather than having wider open streets. Why is that? I think it's it's sort of the mentality of the driver. So I think you're forced to pay attention and slow down. So that's one of the initiatives I think that they're implementing just this week actually is traffic calming. So there's two new pedestrian walkways downtown. Um, there's a few new businesses, uh, the Purple House, which is a very popular uh, sort of small bakery and a couple other businesses downtown too. So uh, historically haven't been allowed to park on Route 115, which is sort of the main drag through town. Mm -hmm. And part of their initiative is to now allow people to park in those areas where they would otherwise have parked illegally. So I right. think it's, again, it's, it's uh, changing, changing the expectations of people's sense for what downtown is. Um, I think people are so used to sort of driving through town like it's sort of a highway. So I think, again, it's you right. know, signage and developing that identity. And like you said, narrowing the roads, I think, just from a driver's mentality to get people to kind of slow down and realize there's more going on there than right. just a gas station and you know some houses from a from a non uh urban development standpoint non-design standpoint a lot of people don't get it that they would think a wider more open street would be a safer street but what you end up getting is people feel like oh a wide open street right intrinsically they think must be 45 right. i'll just blast through here yeah. But on a narrow street with cars, you know, and you know at any time someone could open a door, a ball could come out. And so and people naturally slow down. It's, a, it, uh, it's not quite intuitive to the uninformed, right. but it, uh, it's a much safer and, and actually visually more sustainable thing yeah. than to, like, start widening things, spreading them out, and, like, well, we need parking lots in front of all these things. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's been the issue up there. So we just... Worked with the town on the design uh, for a new community center right off of the uh, right off of the village center. So um, it's an interesting conversation around parking and you know how you disguise those sorts of things. And you know one thing they want to discourage obviously is a lot more asphalt because that's sort of the mentality of what the design is for a big right. back store. Provide as much parking as you can up front. Um, is this sort of wants to flip that on its head? So I think right. uh, yeah, all those things are at play up there. So all kind of play into that idea of what's sustainable sustainable in terms of the development of the downtown area um, why do you why do you think we got to that strip mall big box mentality rather than continuing to put uh buildings closer to the street with sidewalks that are walkable and why are we why do we intrinsically value now these spaces that are more uh, they're a little more quaint more comfortable more they just feel nicer. Yeah. I think regionally it's different. Um, I will, to answer the first question, I think it's just because people don't want to walk anywhere. Um, I think people are used to sort of automobile culture and being able to get from point A to point B very easily. Um, and what's easier than just hopping in a chair and driving there. But I think, <laughs> <Hopping in a laughs> chair, really. yeah. And I think regionally it's very different. So I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, I grew up just outside of Minneapolis, a very sprawled city. And there is very different. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I think, what appeals to, uh, you know, my sort of sensibility of, you know, wanting things to be more quaint, wanting things to have more character. I think that's why New England, yeah, Maine in particular, like, checks all the boxes for me. But it's always very interesting going back there to visit family because we, like, I'll use a brewery as an example. We have plenty of them here. Uh, a lot of them are in buildings that have been converted from some other use. So, you know, probably not built to have, you know, a ton of people come and park and, but there, everything happens in corporate parks. So, you know, you can drive, drive along, you know, the, the main freeway and say, all right, I'm, I always use this example too, but, you know, we said we're, we're going to, I, I can't remember the name of the brewery, but we're going to go here. And we passed it on the highway going the other direction, drove two miles, got off, right. turned around, got on a frontage road and came back. I mean, that's a perfect Texas example. Texas is like that. Every yeah. time we shoot in Texas, you go like a mile past wherever, and then you, you do a U-turn, and it looks like you're going to get back on the highway going the other way, but then at the last second, there'll be this frontage road. Yeah, yeah. Which is, it's just uh, it's so unpleasant. Culture. Yeah, it's very unpleasant. So I think for us, the, the desire in New England is that you know the, the building typologies have existed a long time, so I think there's actually the pieces in place for us to kind of rearrange you know, how developments happen in certain areas, um, especially in those smaller towns and communities. Um, and I think it's, yeah, d development for the automobile's sake in other places where that's just sort of allowed to kind of 
go unchecked for such a long time. Right. I mean, to use the Midwest as an, you have some great Midwest towns, but they had so much available land outside of them as we do less farming and more just breeding. Uh, They just, well, we have as much space as we can. We'll just grow. It's like an unrestrained growth and you don't, you don't uh, really cherish and keep this small town, you know, and in the Midwest or the West as well has these really great, like, you know, downtown, just, they're just straight, yeah. but they have this walkable thing where you almost want to see a tumbleweed going through. Yeah. And it's, yeah. You'll talk to my wife. When we, we first moved to, uh, well, we went to school in Syracuse. We met there and she's from coastal Connecticut. So we moved there. I couldn't find my way around for, <laughs> it was like literally years of trying to figure out, you know, that roads run diagonally. Everything is not up, down, left and right. So mm-hmm. that, that sort of grid system and being able to kind of develop uh, in all directions, um, without any geographical restrictions is a very different way to develop a city in a place. And, Mm -hmm. you know, fortunately here along the coast, things developed along, you know, the ocean, um, just, you know, for reasons related to industry, but also you can't build in the water. So, um, the the mentality of how those little sort of village centers developed is very different here. Um, Right. And yeah, it, and how they naturally would put themselves around harbors and stuff too is yeah. just you get these. It's it's always neat when I go down like Stonington or anywhere else down that way, th- where there there are towns that you can't pass through. You have to go to right, and they've been you know uh, they've been uh, they've been protected from a lot of you know strip mall. Yeah or anything else type of development, and you just feel like you're stepping back into a Norman Rockwell yeah, painting, really. you know? Yeah. And they just have the most incredible feel to them. And it, it, it's kind of discouraging on one hand because you feel like, I hope this doesn't die out, but at the same time, it's, it's in, in this very human scale, it's been preserved rather than human plus car scale, right. you yep. know? And that's really nice um what was your feeling coming from the midwest to new england um you know we my wife's family a lot of them are up in farmington so we spent a lot of our sort of time when we were sort of a little bit further south in the connecticut and westchester area kind of bouncing back and forth between the two and i think what appealed to us was the the historic feel of a lot of the places. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, Main, Main Street, like we were just talking about, um, you know, Farmington is a great downtown. It's vibrant, the university's there. Uh, so I think in that sense, the the idea of sort of small town New England really appealed to us because there was that sort of history embedded into everything. Everything feels right. old, everything feels authentic, everything feels like it's scaled in the right way. I mean, you're not going to drive to Farmington to go to the Cheesecake Factory, for example. Um, so it's just very different in that regard. And the, the, the sense of community and, you know, the people we met, you know, every, everything feels very authentic. I think that's why we really... Now, what is, what is the lack of authentic that, that you would then experience in places like the Midwest or even, you know, like L.A. and all that? Like, what is, what is yeah. that that is the negative space or the opposite of what yeah you i think in it's New england it's developed around corporate culture i think more than here developed yeah. the idea of you know a town um you know just to use minneapolis as an example because that's kind of where i came from it has a great sense of community in certain neighborhoods and those things have right. sort of developed over time but by and large that sort of suburban culture or the the culture outside of those hasn't really developed around a lot of times a cohesive sort of sense of of space so a lot of it is you know where the roads went through and you know it's a lot of parking um and again it development gone unchecked to sort of create something that doesn't really have a a sense of of its own place Mm -hmm. a lot of it is looks like it's you know replicated in three or four different places and it feels very much the same it's almost like the design came from somewhere else like the 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 needs solutions and everything else uh came from somewhere else with no restrictions and was able to be just put across a a blank canvas. Whereas, I mean, you look at Detroit, which is, you know, horribly, you know, gone through some transitions, but supposedly is really coming around in that it has all this infrastructure and, and design that went into it around a singular 
uh, industry, right. right? So there's still that uh, um, that sense of design and place that grew around a specific thing in that location that's left over after that industry leaves, kind of like we right. have in New England. So I think when you have some degree of restraint on growth or a, uh, a you know a north star guiding principle, if you will, to when towns develop and everything else uh, that is integrated more so from geography to people making a living and everything else, and it forms around that all together, it becomes more cohesive rather than just a stamp was imported right. from yep. somewhere and got laid across something and it meets, you know, that other need that is foreign and less um, native to that area. Yeah, to and I, I would agree with that. I think there's more opportunities for creative adaptive reuse here, too, because mm -hmm. things just are older. Things have been around longer here, right. and so there's sort of more... Maybe we've had more time just filtering out the bad stuff. We tear it down and we leave the decent stuff. Yeah, I mean, that could be, <laughs> and I think it's... Yeah, there's just a culture here that I think goes back far enough that, you know, creates a again that authentic feel that you know adaptive reuse is a real thing and i think people have been doing that here for a long time and partly because of well we're e sitting in adaptive reuse e yeah right economy now. economy of means but um but yeah it, it makes for an interesting sort of kit of parts to work with right so i'd like to talk to you about materials and right. i'm going to play devil's advocate to, to start the conversation vinyl siding works well for a cladding in my opinion i'm um, these are not my opinions, but I'm just you just, said it was just your making stuff. <laughs> just making stuff up. Um, vinyl siding works great as a cladding material, and it's inexpensive. My architect, why shouldn't I use it? Uh, I would say vinyl siding is I, so authentic. Authenticity of materials, I think, is a really important. It, it's one of sort of the the most important things I think we can sort of hold ourselves accountable for as designers. So, okay. you know, vinyl siding is meant to look like something it's not. So now what if we could just get like a, just a sheet of plastic and put it on the side of the house? You can, I think Tyvek siding is actually really popular in Maine, <laughs> but uh, I think there, there's a certain noble aspect to the materials that you want to choose. You want something that sort of ages gracefully you want something mm -hmm. that again isn't pretending to be something it's not because this, the certain sort of life cycle of the materials i think is what makes the the texture and the vocabulary of what the the buildings are in maine so interesting you know clapboard is clapboard in a lot of cases um and i think we sort of because there is so much history here we sort of have a an interesting situation to deal with where you know you may be building a, a new home next to uh farmhouse that's been around for 200 years and i think the better way to complement that is to use maybe different materials that aren't sort of pretending to be you know the same materials but sort of made out of a, a sort of manufactured process to it's kind of like, like plastic surgery for homes exactly yeah and it's like it you think it's better, but everyone knows. Right. It's just kind of, mm, yeah. oh, that's not, mm, mm Yeah, you can take a hose to it, but um, <laughs> yeah, right. it's, it's, yeah. Power washer. Yeah, we, um, we use a lot of cedar. We use a lot of, you know, materials that are meant to sort of age in place and develop their own character over time because mm -hmm. that, that's really what relates, at least in my mind, relates the building to the place is how it evolves over time, you know, whether the building is south facing or north facing, all those things have an impact on how something's going to age in place. And I think that appropriately allows things to just, you know, find their, their place and their, their site um, and all the things I think that make the architecture a little bit more interesting, give it a little bit more life, whereas vinyl siding, you can sort of stick it anywhere. Um, that's interesting like you you use something like cedar and it will have a uh much like humans a lifespan and it'll change over time right and that's interesting uh whereas vinyl's meant to be put in once and look exactly the same for the entirety of it being right. put there which again is kind of a, a false idea it's kind of striving for perfection and then seeing how short perfection the idea of perfection right. really falls you know that's right and yeah and then from a life cycle standpoint too you have to consider things like well you know what if someone tears this building down what happens to these materials where do they go right um i think cedar you know obviously dis disposing of that's disposing of a natural material and can be done in a lot of really sustainable ways whereas you know we start to put these um completely sort of industrial based products on our buildings and 
you know, we need to consider what happens to those in a hundred years too. Right. It's just something to be mindful of. I'm not saying there's anything you know, wrong with using vinyl siding for certain applications. I but can say it because I don't have to have anyone pay me for my opinion yeah. when it comes to designing <laughs> anything. It's horrible. It's got, it has its, it has its place for, you know, yeah, certain types of buildings people are going to build because you know, there's a certain economy to it that, you know, sometimes that is what dictates it. But yeah, we strive to use materials that, uh, you know, have a have a life cycle that goes beyond when they're actually going to be cladding material, if that's what we're talking about. But now, to that point, do you think there's any hope of getting good design, good construction, sustainable construction to people who can't afford it currently? Like, I mean, to get a, a cedar on a house, to yep. get decent design, to get good views just even within a tiny not great lot but you can really maximize even a small lot with yeah. good views of gardening relating to house all that uh, what's the hope of being able to do that do you see that in the future at all or? i do i i i mean i am an optimist i think all designers sort of have to be optimists in a certain sense um but i think it's changing our sense for what scale is to me more than anything mm -hmm. because we talk about you know the two driving factors beyond any any project are you know, what's the what's the quality of the project and how big is it? Um, mm -hmm. And so when we look at balancing those two, what we like to do is generally start from you know what's the least amount of space you need to achieve all the goals of this project, and and look at it from that standpoint. And I think just from you know an economic standpoint, and you know being able to sort of afford things uh, with building costs being what they are now, it's really important for us to look at how efficient we can make things because I think you can do a lot with views and sighting and other things where you don't need, you know, 2,000 square feet you're never going to live in. Um, so it's, I think, very realistic to think we can start building homes more efficiently if we start changing the mindsets of the people who are going to be living in them and what their expectations are. So I think quality of space is, is really what sort of is a driving factor behind that, understanding what it, what it means to make a quality living space versus just quantity for the sake of, you know, something being big sure. because we need all these things. Right. So. I think it's a, I don't know if it's a consumer mentality or, or, you know, you know, some other factors that are, that are driving that. But I think if we can start to have a conversation around what it means to make quality space, then I think there's hope to start sort of dictating what the expectations are behind what constitutes a home, for example. So what are some of the things when, again, the rubber meets the road with like design and aspects of a building where you can increase quality, increase the appeal of the building while not breaking the bank yeah i think it's placement of windows just being smart about uh you know right sizing bedrooms and things like that so we what i, what I like to say is we design around furniture so if you've ever gone to like a really great hotel in manhattan it's going to be half the size of what it is somewhere else but it's going to sort of give you all the the same things that you'd get in another place just do it in a more mindful way because you know you're used to, to having to deal with, you know, sort of less space available to you. I think it goes to the same conversation we had about, you know, how these towns and cities develop when space goes unchecked, you can sort of do, mm. do what you'd yeah. want with it. Whereas this is, you know, sort of that, but on a smaller scale. Right. So just looking at what those building blocks are and seeing where you can kind of squeeze things here, you know, push things there and really thinking about what what you need versus what, you know, that sort of want factor is. So um, kind of rein in the size and the amount of materials you're using to go into the rest of the building and, and right. allocate that to, all right, how, when we looked at designing our house, we realized we genuinely just don't spend that much time in the bedroom. So, okay, let's shrink the bedrooms. Right. Let's shrink all these other spaces that we don't, because we knew how we lived and I have a design background and I was thinking about this for, you know, five, 10 years. So we just constantly in the design process shrunk all the other areas that we knew we wouldn't use that much right. and allocated more money to the spaces that we use a lot and the uh, specific things within those spaces that we knew we'd enjoy. And that right. really helped um, get us a lot of bang for our buck when we went to actually design and then right. build. So. Yeah, and I think we, we talk about this with clients a lot too. Um, you know, a lot of ways buildings have gotten a lot more simplistic in the last five years. So with, you know, advances in better building envelope technologies, better heating and cooling systems, better windows, you know, mm. all those things sort of amount to areas where you can start to simplify things rather than make them more complicated. So, you know, achieving 
just the aspect of sustainability to achieving, you know, net zero building is just really crunching the numbers and doing the math. There's right. not a whole lot of magic to it. And we have some great suppliers, um, great vendors, people, you know, who, who you can, as a homeowner, work directly with to kind of start to think about folding some of those aspects into the design of any building, whether it's a complicated, you know, commercial structure or a very simple residential structure. So I think there's there's lots of ways we can work towards kind of a, a simpler, uh, I guess a simpler assembly of what it what it takes to make a building, but also um, just simpler in terms of our thinking about what, what we actually need. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when, when we approached our house, my wife really wanted a basement and I was really against it. For one, we were in just like a field of solid ledge ledge you know <laughs> yeah um and for so many reasons i'm glad we didn't and i think it would have probably been about thirty thousand dollars more yeah. to, to put in a basement but with what we could structurally build the foundation of our house we could also use that material as the finished floor right and it's like you're you're killing two birds with one stone and really if you do it right and you insulate the slab and isolate it from you know exterior walls and stuff it it turned out really well and we're really happy we did it that way, not yeah. just for moisture issues, but also for costs and, and everything else. And we put all of our storage in the attic, yeah. you know, and it, yeah. it's worked really, really well. And it seems like people get stuck in these ideas of, well, I need the, you know, all these mansard or whatever, huge roof lines and spaces yeah. up there that we never use, but it at least signals to my neighbors that I'm doing well or <laughs> yeah. It's like these preconceived ideas of of things that you need or want or, you know, that you that you kind of have to psychologically work against, I right. would imagine, as a designer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean the basement conversation is a, like a classic. Like literally could put like three things on a list and the basement conversation is one we always have. So you know, we talk a lot about what, what we need and you know, we haven't have a lot of sort of young kids in our families, uh, which is, I think, a really great study in how much space you actually need because they change so quickly. We talk mm -hmm. a, a lot about, you know, how we design for, you know, what you might need when they're two is very different from what they might need now when my kids are like eight, for oh, example. yeah, right. So how that, you know, sensibility sort of plays into it. Um, but like you said, basements and, and storage spaces and things like that, I think everybody's convinced they need this basement to just store a lot of stuff where the reality is that anything that goes down there is probably not coming out. Um, right. I mean, maybe a few things, but but most of it's just a space for a play, the place for things to die. And traditionally, you needed, you know, basement space to house mechanical systems. But right. everything now is so much simpler, I think, than it than it was 15 years ago. I mean, I still have. We live in an old home. Um, we have sort of our big furnace in the basement and things like that. But a lot of conversations we have now revolve around heat pumps, where a majority of your mechanical equipment actually lives outside of the house, and yep. the rest of it either sits on a floor, or is mounted to the wall, or even can be up in an in an attic space. So, it's uh, it's interesting to have those conversations with clients because, again, that that just goes to changing the mentality about what your expectations are for those things that go into it. Um, right. Because if we if we build a home with a really good building envelope, nice window package. Um, you know, I think they're saying now is uh, the BTUs a person throws off while they're sleeping really doesn't necessitate you needing any real heating in a bedroom. So now they're moving towards, you know, electric panel radiators. And I think for the longest time, electric baseboard was something people avoided using in homes because it was inefficient. But the reality now is that the technologies exist where that actually is, is much more efficient than using things that, you know, rely wholly on fossil fuels uh, okay. we can now are you a cold bedroom person or a warm bedroom person i am a cold bedroom person but i right live there in with no, yeah i have no choice uh, <laughs> or like i said our house is old so it's uh, right. our bedroom is yeah hottest in the winter and or, or coolest in the winter rather than hottest in the summer so we don't <laughs> get any of that yeah i was amazed with the um we did like triple pane windows uh and foot thing insulated walls and blown in cellulose and stuff. And it's just, it's amazing to live in that. I mean, we lived for 15 years probably in a very breezy um, house that when we first moved in, then we replaced the windows and yeah. got it a lot tighter. But man, the ability to just, you know, you're walking around the house in shorts and t-shirts and it's in even warmth everywhere. Yeah, We, we don't have radiant heating and still the heat uh, just from the wood stove absorbs into that slab yeah. and all night it's radiating that heat back in and the sun hits it and yeah and there, it's so simple we have 
air con- we've never had air conditioning never thought we would and but because we used a heat pump right it was like oh this does air conditioning too yeah yeah it's just a <laughs> and so you know being october it is october right yeah, being october about. i was you know i was like well I'll turn the air conditioning on because it was like 85 yesterday yeah. or whatever um and so materials and all that what are what are the very elementary design principles for you like when it comes down to the decisions you're making when you're and i i ask people about this a lot like design is a very subjective process where you take your experience and everything you've learned and help people solve problems with your life yep. essentially so what are the foundational principles if you had to list like three that you keep coming back to to criticize uh ideas that a client comes up with or yep. even ideas that you come up with what are they kind of like the touchstone things yeah i would say start with a concentration on simplicity i think Simplicity of form, simplicity of spaces, uh, you know, looking at how you sort of edit things down to the real basic necessities before you start to kind of build things back in because we sort of, everybody comes with a list. Everybody has a preconceived notion of what it is to, um, you know, a, a home or a space for them. And I think if you can sit down and have a, a mindful conversation with somebody about, you know, how you edit that down and mm-hmm. how you really break that down to the elements and, and then have a discussion about what you really need, that that to me is like a very fundamental piece of the conversation of the design for any building. Um, I think don't over design too. I think a lot of times, you know, architects and designers and you know, homeowners and people have, you know, a million great ideas because we're just, there are so many things uh, coming at us from so many different directions. Now we, we have, you know, clients that share their Pinterest boards with us, which is a great resource, I think, but um, it's all so much more available than it was like five years ago. Right. So being able to like, you know, take a couple of deep breaths and having a conversation about what's, what are the real goals here? Like what are the real important things we want to achieve uh, through the design process? Um, that's, that's a really important thing to us. And I think, you know, not over assigning space because space is about the people who inhabit it more than the building now, itself. What do you mean by over assigning space? So over assigning space, I think over programming something like giving it a much more specific use than it might otherwise need. Um, okay. you know, we talk about like materials and, you know, designing something for the moment rather than designing something for, you know, the next 10 or 15 years. So we you know, approach like the design of interiors, for example, around, you know, letting the space be the space and then letting the life be what the people bring to it because mm-hmm. inherently someone's going to have to someone's gonna have to move their stuff into that house and we don't always have the opportunity to you know pick and choose everything that goes into a space so to over design something i think does the clients a disservice because it means ultimately they're going to have to sort of go back to the drawing board at some point and, and, right. and reconsider that so designing a space that works now but works 10 years from now is an important thing to think about so to make it slightly more flexible than extremely specific exactly okay yep. yeah and i think there's a time and place for things to be specific but that's better to do that on the level of the site rather than the the, the room scale okay. for example so we yeah we like to design in a lot of flexible living space not a lot of walls if we don't need them um, yeah our our house that we had for 15 years here in Biddeford, I ended up taking out every single wall downstairs. Yeah. yeah. And that's and a fun I mean project. every <laughs> single wall. <laughs> it was like by the end of it, we had like some massive wood beams and columns and that was about it. Yeah. And, and I think I added a wall where we put in like a downstairs bathroom pantry and laundry room slash right, closet. Which, yeah. Demonstrates the opposite way to go about it too. I mean, I think in the case of a lot of these older buildings here, you know, it's a lot of small rooms because it was hard to heat all those rooms with wood. And Every single room in that house was compartmentalized. Yeah. You could the kitchen would be one single room had three, four doors on it, and then there was a bedroom, and then there was like a um, there was a dining room, and you could shut that completely off. There was an entry, and you could shut that completely right. off. And there's a living room. Like every single space was yeah. like door, and so. It ended up that we had a lot of extra doors and we're actually using a lot of those doors in our new house, which yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. We live differently, I think, than you know, people did 125, 100 years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, even differently than people lived, uh, say, 25 or 30 years ago. So I think it, it's allowed us to kind of look at it more simplistically because, you know, the, the idea of living you know, together in a home as a family is, is, is a much more open prospect now than I think it was. Um, back when so 
Oh, yeah. I mean, just the idea of the kitchen being closed off from the living room, right. dining room, so you didn't show this mess to the dining like it's a it's a it's more of a communal thing between host and right. guests to almost cook together yeah. and eat together and have that. Yeah, we embrace the mess now. I guess maybe that's the difference is, maybe. is it's, it's the madness can <laughs> be sort of a part of what maybe makes a that society it. and everything is developed where we just are becoming more honest about how messy life is and and kind of embracing that to a degree. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. <laughs> we we definitely yeah, we entertain quite a bit and the fun part is, is sort of the mess that comes with it too. Right. So how do you, do you have any psychological tricks to talk a client away from bad ideas? No, I think, I mean, I, I don't know that it needs to be psychological tricks. I think if you can, if you can have an honest conversation about what people's needs are, uh -huh. there are some universal truths that I think people can't deny if you lay it out in the right way. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we have those conversations with people. It's, you know, it's more showing examples of, you know, why something might work a better way. So it's right. that idea of not constructive criticism, but, you know, again, just continuing that conversation to really bring them into, you know, the mindset of, of you know, what we think about as designers and you know, what they think their preconceived notions are. So I, I think for us, it's, it's really just having good, real conversations with people and doing it really early on in the process, too. So mm -hmm. managing expectations of, you know, what they, you may think you're going to get out of the, the process because it really is something that is, it should be a very collaborative experience. I don't want to live in my head and then have that come out on paper, you know, and six months later realize that that wasn't a successful conversation, you know, because we didn't talk about a few really basic things early on. So right. like if you can have those conversations with clients and, and just be very frank and honest with them, I think it goes a long way towards creating a, a, a collaborative process that, yield successful results and is also hopefully fun for everybody too because right. we do this because we think it's a lot of fun um we hope you know for clients it's obviously probably more overwhelming because they don't do this every day a lot of them will do it one right. one time maybe twice in their lifetime so if you can break that up into sort of more palatable pieces um you know develop a good level of trust and real and and have them realize that you know you're sort of trying to look out for their best interests at heart too um i think that's a that's a recipe for a successful collaboration with clients rather than, you know, trying to Jedi mind trick them into, you know, thinking a certain way. It just, it just, uh, in the end, just, uh, just won't work out if that's the case. Yeah. I think there's, there's too many decisions that need to be made along the way for. So as a, as a client approaches you and, and you start to work on the design process, you're seeing red flags of maybe, uh, ways that you have to then have an open, as you're saying, yep. an honest conversation with them that involves a degree of education of like, and this is where I would probably fall very short is I'd probably just be too blunt and, yeah. and like, well, you think you want this, but you're only being told you want that. You don't really want it. What you want is this because of this, that, and the other. Yeah. And I imagine there's a large degree of, um, personal interpersonal communication skill that a successful architect, uh, or at least a, an architect that is going to be successful in those relationships, because you'll have people like Frank Lloyd Wright and, and others that their clients will kind of just pull their hair out, but they'll make these, you know, uh, world heritage type yeah. of buildings. It's a different deal sometimes. Yeah. And that's, that's a weird thing. Yeah, I think it is. I think there's, I mean, I, w I would love to think that we're designing world heritage sites, but probably not, not yet at least. Um, but uh, we're design builders too, so we have the advantage of being able to balance out the sort of, uh, I always say artsy-fartsy to people, but like the, the sort of really delicate sort of ideas that are more artistic and, you know, sort of more specifically relate to kind of design thinking. Um, and then we deal with the very pragmatic aspects of, you know, how is this built? How much does it cost? And we try to balance those two things out simultaneously. So now do you guys hold design and build with under, under the same umbrella? Under or? the same umbrella. Yeah. So, so how do you, how do you business wise, yep. how did you make that decision and what do you think the benefits and drawbacks are with that model? So the benefits are, I think we save a lot of people money. We save a lot of people time. Um, and the two things, you mm -hmm. know, obviously are interchangeable a lot of the, a lot of the times too. But I think a, as a designer, um, I think what was most frustrating was coming up with these great ideas and, and really not having a good finger on the pulse of what all the ramifications are in terms of cost. So, 
the the labor market of the materials market right now is is insane so anybody who's building or designing anything now knows that um it's very unpredictable in terms of you know where the market's going i mean right. things are getting more expensive um but the labor market in maine is very unique in the sense that we don't draw from a big pool of skilled skilled laborers either we we just have sort of a limited amount of resources so a lot Man, of times the the talent in new england of construction and yeah. and finished construction and everything else compared to somewhere like las vegas yeah. it's just the the collective mentality about what they value putting into buildings right maybe it's just because their climate's a little more bearable so they feel they can just kind of yeah no way it'll be fine <laughs> yeah and it's i think it's the yeah the expectations around like if if there's a limited amount of people available to you. They, they should be doing good work. And I think people do generally do very sort of high quality work where we yeah. live. Um, but for us, the, the desire to balance out design uh, and construction simultaneously is to give our clients the most information as early on as possible and have those difficult conversations before we've gone down the road of, you know, designing everything, including, you know, your master shower and made all these selections mm -hmm. without necessarily knowing what the you know on the back end all those things are going to cost you too so being yep. able to get to that point really early on in the process is very advantageous for you know our team but also for our clients as well and i think that's part of part of what we try to do is sort of accelerate and, and shortcut the process in ways that you know just right. a typical design bid build approach doesn't allow you to do right so it seems like when i was coming out of architecture school it, it was an uphill battle to convince people um you're going to get good design with a design build firm. Like it, it in the past yeah. seemed to be like, we'll throw in this design element if you use us as a contractor, Yeah, you know, yeah. and that, but that in the last decade, I've, I feel like I've seen that change to a large degree. I know, uh, Caleb Johnson studio you now they have a design build aspect to them that, that they're doing an, an incredibly high, uh, deliverable, you know, design yep. and build. Uh, you guys are doing that, and there's there's a lot of others that I'm I'm finding are doing the same thing. Yes, when we look at you know other firms who are doing that, a lot of times we're looking outside of you know just kind of the, the Portland market too, because I think it's it's sort of caught hold in other markets a little bit quicker than it has here, and mm -hmm. I think it's maybe um, well, maybe the mentality is just a little bit different. But there's quite a few firms out on the West Coast that are doing it. Um, you know, and, and kind of those peppered in across the country. Some people I went to school with have a successful design build company out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and it just seems like the conversation is just changing a little bit in terms of what to expect from the process. And I think right. what's, what's, what's happening is that mindset's changing a little bit around, you know, what it means to, to hire a designer where you said, you know, design build, I think traditionally has been, uh, you know, we'll throw in this design for you. Like maybe sure. you can tell us what rooms you want and we'll lay it out. Um, and, and historically it's been a contractor working with a designer. But um, I think now what clients are realizing is they can sort of expect more from the process. Mm -hmm. I think they can, they can get more too. And I think just having an open conversation about what the benefits are from people, they, they a lot of times do get it um, in terms of, you know, what, well, you know, why wouldn't I want to know as early on as possible how much this is going to cost me because it's, you know, ultimately going to save me money and just have a, it's going to create a better process for everybody. It seems like there'd be, if you have a, a solid relationship between the, the design aspect and the build aspect that, you know, you just end up with a better product. Right. Yeah. And I think obviously. just through the whole process too, I mean, up front we talk about, you know, how the decision-making process is a little bit different, but we like to think the guys we have in the field, whether they're our sort of apprentice carpenters or our project managers, those are builders that think like designers. And, you know, our designers right. are, are trained to sort of consider some of the more practical things, I think, oftentimes sort of get pushed to the back burner. Um, sure. So to have that on both ends of the project, I think, adds a lot of value, um, tangible value, but also intangible value too, because, you know, we talk about like, what's that quality control process like through the build? I think, you know, contractually an architect will go out every couple of weeks, but if you've got a design build team on site, boots on the ground every day, you've got that, you know, you've got oh, yeah, eyes your on site visits are, are different animals. Yeah, really. absolutely. And you have, there's just so much more flexibility built into it too. If yeah. you need to incorporate changes along the way, it's not, hmm. It's not costing you know money in the same sense it would if you've got to sort of go through the same channels to just kind of have that you know I guess level of paperwork more than anything that has to go along with just making some simple changes. So sure. like I think in that sense too, it's a much more fluid process. Okay. Um, 
Now, what do you see as far as technology in the future and what we see now uh, doing some type of quantum leap in our building? Because it seems like, I keep thinking about it, like homes and buildings seem to be the last kind of handcrafted thing that we invest yeah. lots of money in, where everything else is mass produced and, and has uh, a, a, just a ridiculous amount of um, efficiency and cost uh, reduction built into it. I yep. mean, to, to get a tailor-made car like everyone does for houses, yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. How, how is technology going to change our built environment coming um, up here? I, I think there's going to be some leaps in building materials. I think in Maine in particular, we have a lot of untapped resources uh, for well, you know, lumber-based products and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, starting, I think, in maybe five years, we'll start to see more of that uh, begin to become sort of a part of what we can source locally, um, yep. which you know, has obviously a sustainability aspect to it, which is great too. But you know, we talk a lot more about panelized construction now than we did five years ago. And I think mm -hmm. partly because there are some local vendors, local uh, reps now that um, you know, we can look at and say there, there are ways to, to, to streamline some of these processes to create you know, buildings where you know, it, it shows up say 50% built and then we just save a lot more time on the, sure. on the labor end of it. We um, just did a shoot for a company. Uh, they did, it, it was these, I mean, they were bolt together, pre-cut, just solid wood panels. Yeah. And they're the finished surface on the interior and they're also structural. Yeah. And then all this insulation goes on the outside. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was really neat. And the thing went up in like a day. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's where I think I see the biggest change in terms of, you know, how our processes can change from your traditional stick build house to things that show up on the back of a truck and yep. go together in, in a week. And I think, you know, for us, the, the huge benefit, you know, not only is time, but you know, we contend with the elements here all the time, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, how we prep a building site to get it closed in for winter is always a really, a really huge consideration in terms of just time and cost. Um, and that's why, you know, Maine always has, sort of has that busier season where you're sort of prepping and getting things teed up for, you know, closing things in so you right. can work inside in the winter if possible. Um, so I see that as kind of being the biggest change and, you know, it's, it's things that are available now, but you have to sort of look for them. Whereas I think the, the shift in the mindset's going to be, that's going to become more of the, more of the norm moving forward um, mm -hmm. and less the sort of the, the traditional way that, you know, we've been building homes for the last 50 years. I wonder if, if we'll get to the point where we have an almost, you know, relatively automated process of building homes for the average individual like myself and, you know, yeah. and then there's more of a really high end tailored thing that, that, that is different. I mean, it seems like with 3D printing, they're they're trying to work out things to where you're going to have a robot on site, like constructing all your walls and everything else. And yeah, then it's I mean, just a matter of finish after that. We'll see. I'm not sure Maine's going to be the first place to see that, but um, it's it's inter interesting to see what some of the sort of more experimental uh, building outfits are doing in, in Europe and other places where they sort of early embraces of that technology. Um, but yeah, it's I think there's a, there's a changing landscape out there. And, you know, for us, I think the first leap is really going to be, you know, panelized construction and how we focus on, you know, the building envelope as opposed to, you know, all the mechanical systems that, you know, right. historically in the past were a bigger, bigger part of the process. Hopefully our neighbor sawing PVC pipe is not coming up <laughs> on the mics too much here. But um, if you could change the business of design in one way, what would it be? If I could change the business of design? Um, because for me, I went to architecture school and started to work as an architect. And there was a lot about the actual, again, rubber meets the road thing of yeah. practicing architecture that was uncomfortable. And I just didn't have it to stick with yep. a very difficult business. It is. Um, yeah, I guess I think it would be, uh, from the client side, be, it would be nice if people really did recognize the inherent value in what you do, right? Like we don't necessarily sell anything. Like we're not selling a product. We're not selling a car. We're not, you know, we are, we are in essence selling a product. That's sort of the end result of the construction process. Right. But, um, the, the, the business aspect of sort of getting paid for your time, I think is a really difficult thing because we know mm. the value we add, but it would be, it'd be great if the, the changing mindset was that, um, you know, hiring, 
hiring a, a good design team is, is just as important as anything else. And, you know, the, the idea of you know, building a home or, you know, buying a new home, that type of thing. I think, you know, people don't have a problem paying, you know, a realtor, for example, to go out and help them because they provide that service to do right. it. And I think in that same sense, the, the architect does that. Um, but, you know, understanding that that costs money too, because it really does take time and effort oh, yeah. and expertise yeah. to do it right. Um, that would be one, <laughs> one thing I would change, I think would, uh, and I also think, uh, you know, just, just changing the, the mindset of what it takes to getting from point A to point B and really, um, really being transparent about what the process is, which is something we try to do. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years uh, really trying to kind of develop our own processes in terms of how we work, um, you know, and having people uh, illustrate that the people having them really understand what the value is in terms of hiring a designer. Because I think mm -hmm. the way that, you know, certain organizations have presented that, you know, value built in uh, of architecture is, you know, maybe something a, a small percentage of people understand, but if we can kind of, develop a, a conversation around, you know, why that's important for any building project, I think would be a, a better, a better way to approach. It. And it would, you know, be really, I think, helpful for us as, you know, designers and design builders to uh, be able to have a, an open discussion about the value of good design. Right. It seems like the American mindset is a little more of an uphill battle where they see design surfaces as kind of a luxury thing. Right. Where a European mindset is far more, this is, this is part of average life. Yeah. Is that it, it, they understand the value that comes out of uh, a thoughtful design rather yeah. than get it up, get it doing what it does so I can move on. Right. You know, there's, it's a, it's a different deal. Um, and, uh, I think for a final question, what is the most fulfilling aspect of architecture for you? The most fulfilling aspect. Um, and why? Of yeah, course. yeah. Uh, <laughs> we get this question a lot, actually. Um, and for us, it's been interesting. Do you get that question from clients? We get that question from clients. Um, we get that question just from people about, you know, what, what we do. And when we say, you know, oh, we're, you know, sort of design, build, construction company. Um, it's, it, I think, makes people think about it a little bit differently than they would if you're, you know, just a designer. So I think what's, what's the most sort of fulfilling part about what we've been able to do in kind of the handful of years we've been around is we've been able to work with clients who I think otherwise wouldn't have been as successful, you know, launching a business or designing their first home for their family as they have been because we've been really able to kind of navigate the, the practical pieces and, and the design sensibilities simultaneously. Um, so they're, you know, I would say probably a dozen small businesses now uh, around Portland, um, most of which are doing great um, and, and have really benefited from you know, our ability to have those conversations and, and help them sort of leverage uh, their investments to create a business that's been successful. So that, to me, has been a really rewarding aspect of it. Um, and on the sort of other end of the spectrum, we've worked uh, just finishing up a project with our uh, the town of North Yarmouth um, and a community center and just being able to have the frank conversations with the town that, you know, has really never undertaken a, a big building project like the one they are just completing now um, has been really rewarding because I think the, the way it started, there were, there were sort of a lot of negative connotations around change and oh, sure. the benefit of what uh, they're going to get out of the investment that they're going to make as a community. And I think now that we're sort of at the tail end of that, everybody's realizing that, you know, the sky's not falling down if they were, you know, concerned about costs and things like that at the beginning. Um, to be able to kind of see the faces of the people who were in some of those meetings early on, you know, that were very opposed to doing anything has been a really, really rewarding process. And it's mm. been, you know, it, design is a slow thing typically, design and construction, because it just takes time. But to see that sort of evolve over the last three years and realizing that now we've got you know, more time kind of kind of in the rearview mirror and to be able to step back and have the perspective on how all that's evolved over time is a really fulfilling thing. And I think it'll be it'll be really interesting too to see it in the building using it because I think it's right. just gonna provide right. you know, I think everyone's gonna, you know, hopefully go into the space and think, Wow, this is why didn't we do this ten years ago? Right. Why didn't we do this fifteen years ago? Because um, there's a lot of great a lot of great value there, I think, to to develop that. One of the one of the most obvious uh, instances of that that I've seen is here in Biddeford um, across from the bank there's a coffee shop Elements and uh, before it was Elements like a bunch of businesses had tried to make it 
worked there yeah. and they just kind of came in and did their own you know uninformed ideas of what would make a nice space and because of my background i can go into a you know a restaurant and like man the, the, they need mood lighting they yeah. need to turn off these fluorescent lights and I, you know i can you know were it not to offend people i could very easily like hey go to home depot yeah. get some pendant lights and you know but i just try and keep my mouth shut but uh elements uh i think I forget exactly how it came about, but they were able to, through the city, I think, have an architect involved in its design. And what it became was, well, wow, this is a really great place yeah. to, to go downtown and sit and look out these windows all of a sudden. It's really nice. And that one piece just totally, it, it was the kind of the, you know, the thing that started in many ways this spark of revitalization yeah. downtown because all of a sudden people were coming to that as a destination because an architect had you know taken out a wall and put in a beam and exposed it and exposed the brick but you can read the structures in it and it's interesting you know and they had cut back the plaster and they just left it yeah and you can see where there's new brick and you know and the whole thing is very interesting visually it's a it's a really nice place to be yeah and this business is succeeding in my opinion to a high degree specifically because of the involvement of an architect yep. you know so i th there's a huge amount of value to what you guys do and i think we just in general don't realize how much it affects our lives we don't realize uh enough or admit enough or think on it enough how much the design space you know it, it is a home it is where we spend a huge amount of our time working every day and, right. and how much it affects us so yeah yeah and i think it comes down to that idea of of quality wanting quality over quantity and i think yep. that's that overriding um sort of challenge we have as a as a culture is recognizing that you know having a, a few really really nice things is a lot better than having a lot of really not so nice things yeah so things are just going to disintegrate after a while right i mean beauty really turns into sustainability exactly those are the things that will be maintained and not torn down right. and rebuilt and all yeah that, so. exactly well thank you for coming all the way down to bitterford yeah. yeah, thanks for, for a me. great conversation really appreciated yeah. it thank you so much and uh check out matthew's article in the upcoming issue of main home design which will be the architecture issue so great. cool thanks a lot for listening and watching and thanks matt thank you